Hello, welcome to The Eclectic Reader. Listen to great books and stories while you use your eyes and hands for other things. Now here's your host, Madison Mason. Hi, Madison Mason here. Welcome back. Chapter 12, The Gray Quarry Boys. The Gray Quarry Boys, Chapter 12, The Coon. They ran on for another half hour or so, following the distant music of the hounds. In the open field, Sonny killed the light to save batteries. While Joey ran beside him in the dark, they talked. Joey told him of his life on Okinawa, and Sonny in turn told the boy small bits about Korea, but not the stuff a guy would really want to know, battles and killing, the good horror stories of war. But something told Joey not to ask. Sonny was the only person he met in Gray Quarry who had even heard of Okinawa. They were men of the world. Sonny stopped. Shh! Listen, they got him treed. A different cry resounded now from the distant pack that even Joey could discern. No broken calling back and forth, but a constant frantic baying. They pushed on, following the sound. Joey grew more excited. His brain was recording everything, and he savored each small piece of stimulus, hoping it would last forever. They hit another creek and climbed another hill through the brush. He wanted to ask all kinds of questions, but Sonny's concentration told Joey to shut up. A few minutes later, they crashed down an embankment into a clearing. Sonny threw on the light and spotted the dog scurrying around a monstrous pine tree, leaping at the lowest branches ten feet off the ground. The hounds were in a frenzy, bounding in the air and falling back, crying with blood desire. Foam flew from their mouths like chunks of snow as they screamed their mournful frustration to the black branches above. Sonny waded in among the dogs, shining the light through the web of pine branches as Joey stood gasping for breath and tried to figure out where the coon was. Sarah sat silent and trembling, her gleaming eyes riveted on a single spot thirty feet up. The lead males tried in vain to climb the tree, yanked up by a passion born millions of years behind them, driven by pure instinct to kill and eat, to smear them all with warm blood reeking of fear. They bounded into the air, flailing yo-yos, played by some malevolent giant to crash back to earth and leap again, crazed, driven. The younger dogs, the stupid jerks that dragged him into the creek, ran around grinning and yelping, their tongues lolling out, banging into each other, clumsy escapees from the Keystone Cops' kennel. Their tails fanned the air, and they yelped their childish best to imitate their elders. Sarah, the huntress, sat patiently, tail swishing, flushed with the chase. Her eyes never left her quarry, high in the darkness. Sonny went to her, but she ignored him, locked in a ballet of death and the dance wasn't over. Where is she, girl? He whispered. Sarah stood and growled, eyes on the tree, and barked once, a deep, throaty, commanding bark that rang through the night. It drove the males even wilder than before, screaming and howling for blood. The din was painful. Sonny watched her eyes and flashed a powerful beam high up the candlestick pine. He moved it around to several different places, unable to spot the coon. Finally, he followed Sarah's eyes and carefully drew a line with the light to where she was fixed. He grinned. Joey, come here, he whispered. See him? Joey waded through the dogs and squinted up the beam to a spot 30 feet up the tree. Where? I don't see... Wow! There he is! Yep, he's a big one, ain't he? Huge was more like it. Joey felt like he was looking at a small bear in a zoo. From high in the trees, two shiny black eyes peered down out of a face that had to be nine or ten inches at its breadth. The raccoon was hanging over either side of a large branch, secure in the knowledge that he was unreachable, observing them with oriental detachment. He didn't seem scared. In fact, he gave the impression of superiority, particularly given the performance of the deranged dogs. Wow, great, Joey admired. All right, get going, Sonny grinned, and he rubbed the boy's head. Get what? he asked innocently. Huh? Joey stood in stupid miscomprehension, mouth open, not daring to think what he suspected. Get up the tree. Get him out, boy. 
Sonny said, not quite so patient this time. Suddenly, it dawned on Joey what Sonny might be talking about. He had the cold realization why he'd been asked on the expedition. Not because he was such a great guy or so neat to have around. No, he was small and wiry and could climb a tree like a monkey. He was known for arboreal skill among the local kids that saved his skin a couple of times when he was the coon and they were the hounds. How the hell had Sonny found out? Shit, this was awful. He didn't want to climb that tree. Me? His breath made clouds in the light. Yeah, you. Climb up. Knock him out of the damn tree. Go on, or we'll be here all night. I it's too high. I can't even reach the bottom branches, he protested. It made him ashamed to hear his oily whine reappear in front of a real hero, but he was scared, for real. I'll boost you up. Come on, let's go. The light went out suddenly, and Joey thought he'd fainted from panic. But no such luck. He felt Sonny's strong hand pull him to the side of the massive tree. You ready? Up you go, he said. But before Joey could object, powerful arms hoisted him, and he was facing the trunk in the dark with saucers for eyes. He felt like a baby, arms and legs flailing, and he wanted to cry. Stand on my shoulders, Sonny strained. Joey found his shoulders with his sneakers, and they leaned against the tree, farmer grunting and boy not breathing at all. Okay, buddy, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hold your ankles and push you up and you grab a branch. Can you do it? When he said buddy, that was it. Joey had to do it. Buddy meant something. You didn't let a buddy down. Come on, l let's go, Joey gulped, determined to die for his buddy on this stupid coon hunt, if necessary. He wished he'd never said yes. He'd love to be back in his broken bed with the covers around his chin, itching and whining. One, two, three! He was shoved up into the air and started to fall backwards. Sonny took a quick step back to recover and Joey pitched forward, banging his forehead against the trunk so hard he saw stars in the darkness. He clawed desperately overhead, grasping for a branch, but came back with only bark under his nails. He fell against the trunk again, breathing hard. Did you get it? It's too high. C can you throw me a little higher? He gasped. I think I can get it this time, buddy. All right, here goes. Sonny squatted and sprang. Suddenly Joey was airborne, flying in the pitch black. He felt the rough bark of a large branch on his forearm. As he slipped earthward, he grabbed on, locked his claws around the branch, and swung his legs up. There he hung upside down like a sloth in the National Geographic. You up? Yep, he strained, pulling up onto the branch until he straddled it. I'm up. The light snapped on and Joey could see around enough to figure out a climb path. Good man, came Sonny's gentle voice, filling him with pride. Now go get him. He's on the other side. Any boy can tell you, you don't just climb a tree. Trees have characteristics. Pines are tricky. Flaky bark, dead branches, and clumps of needles are obstacles. Joey felt around for the path of least resistance and hoped he didn't find snakes or spider nests on the way up. He'd heard stories of raccoons killing dogs in the water by jumping on their heads and drowning them. God only knows what this one would do to some smart-ass little dope climbing up his tree in the dark. Joey stifled a dry sob and hated himself for talking his stupid mother into this. How could she let him do something so dangerous? And he still had to clean the house. He was weak from the running and days of illness, and he looked down into the stinging light and wished the dogs would shut the hell up. He understood how the coon felt. The branches grew closer together, and he could shinny from one to another and slowly work his way up the tree. But as he grabbed the trunk and pressed his body hard against it, something very strange happened. While he had the hives, he'd itched like never before. And though he'd been warned by both mother and doctor not to scratch, it was so awful he couldn't resist. So he'd start by rubbing, not scratching, to save his skin from being ripped to shreds. Finally, he couldn't stand it. The more he scratched, the better it felt, filling his body with a sort of sweet, intoxicating ecstasy. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of The Eclectic Reader. Please go on to the next numbered episode to continue. Also, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 
If you'd like to help support the project, you can donate under Madison Mason at Patreon. And please check out our website, kltkrdr.com, for more information. Hi, this is Madison Mason. I want to personally thank you for listening to The Eclectic Reader and invite you to share your experience, your thoughts, and your suggestions. We have many great books lined up for the future, but if you have requests for anything that is in the public domain, please email us at kltkrdr at gmail.com. Kltkrdr at gmail.com